everybody. This is Jim Nelson. Welcome to today's session. We have uh, a lot of material to cover today, and so we will be moving with some speed. So our topic today is improving the data center efficiency, and we're also going to talk about some future trends as we see. And it takes uh, just a moment or two. There's my handsome devil self. You're stuck with me for the next hour. So in our outline, we're gonna talk about uh, data center efficiency and why it matters. Along with that, along with the efficiency, we'll touch a little bit on the carbon footprint. We'll talk about some pretty accepted measures of, of measuring efficiency, which is PUE. And we're gonna also talk a little bit about some of the low hanging fruit or target areas uh, that are traditionally where you can gain some efficiency. And then we'll touch a little bit at the end on emergency technologies, since we are approaching the end of the calendar year, give you some thoughts to move you through the balance of this year and into uh, the new year, calendar year 2020. As we know, having a data center is a significant investment and they use a lot of energy. In some cases, I do like this video for or this uh, graphic, sorry about that. Data centers in some ways are the factories of the digital modern age. So why does data center efficiency at a 10,000 foot level, why does it matter? Number one, we would like to stay in operation. We'd like to save some money and we'd also like to save some of our natural resources for our children and future generation, generations. Data centers and the emergence of technology have become a concern over the last decade to 12 or 14 years uh, that we would, uh, these installations would be using up significant amounts of the available electricity on a global basis. So with global data center traffic and the internet of things and technology growing and doubling quite rapidly, we'll take a little bit of a look at this. A different way of looking at this. If you looked at the global IT industry, the sector, as you see the third bar down on this chart, what they would contribute uh, to climate change is significant, rated up there with only some of the superpowers and major economies. So it's something to, to consider since IT is used globally uh, and is really a sector specific concern for our technologists and facilities people. Just some general information here, and I'm not gonna read all of these slides, uh, but it gives some examples about every time you do a Google search, what does that take? And also, uh, Cisco does some estimates on our changing world, is how many videos are out there. And you know, as we walk around with our new technologies on our smartphones and iPhones and uh, Androids, and as you see people capturing information on a real-time basis and sharing it around the world. So at a high level, how can you be more energy efficient? One is to use renewable or alternate sources of power where, uh, where available. And more and more companies are looking at this and trying to become reliant or committed to some degrees on renewable energies. And why that's on the energy side, the other big piece, and we'll talk about this over the course of the next hour, is how do we save money and get more efficient? So just a couple of quick slides on renewable energies, whether that's from uh, wind farms or ocean usage, et cetera. There's a lot of great technologies that are coming across. And that is also driving some large corporate decisions of where to place some of their critical data center facilities. Reducing your carbon footprint. So one example that's highlighted here is Norway. They do a lot of things from hydro. And when they look at that versus uh, fossil fuels, when they can compare 
the impact to the carbon footprint is a, a significant reduction that's come out of the Scandinavian countries. Improving your energy efficiencies. So it really gets down to how can I use the power more efficiently, save some in the future, and uh, try and curb the significant growth of uh, uh, using the capacity and demand that's generated around the world. Some of that's in placement. As you can see here, if you go to a colder climate, I happen to be talking to you from uh, the northern part of the United States, closer to the Canadian border, and it is cold as the Dickens outside right now, and I see snow and high winds. So that can be good uh, for using open windows. <laughs> so improving your efficiencies, data centers can become more efficient by doing a few things. Using the vendor supplied power saving and standby modes, using energy monitoring and softwares that are more and more available out there, and also looking at fine tuning our cooling systems. All of these can have a significant impact on a global basis to how much electricity that we need to generate. So, there's probably some of you are saying, I'm not planning to build a new data center up in Scandinavia or in Iceland or up near the Canadian border. What can I do with my installation that we have now? I do like this, knowing what we know and knowing what we don't know. We do know that data centers in critical environments need to be available. If there's downtime, we've talked about downtime in many previous of these webinars and the impact on that. We know it's expensive. We may or may not know how energy efficiency we are, but we do know future technologies are going to impact it. We know that's going to happen, but we don't know what those specific impacts may be. So a logical starting point uh, that's been a proven methodology is to look at a few target area where it's low hanging fruit and you can get the fastest efficiency returns. One of that is in your HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and your cooling and environmental. The other is taking a look at your electrical and condition power systems. Of course, your IT equipment, and also your people and processes that manage all of these. I put in here a professional tip. If you are the energy efficiency expert at your organization, you should not be on your own because this is an organizational issue. It's, just, it's really not a specific IT issue or a facilities issues or an audit or compliance issues. Recognize and coordinate and see how many different areas that you can work with as you do with whether it's business continuity, whether it's IT, or whether it's capacity planning. You need to have some kind of an energy efficiency strategy and it needs to be formulated to a policy. There's an old saying, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we'll talk a little bit about metrics and measurements and what points you can do. Target those areas with high return, as I've already said, and leverage any programs or ideas you may have internally or that are available in your region or your country or uh, through good practices. So if you're gonna measure and establish that benchmark and a baseline, you need to have that put in place. So the second bullet, I'm gonna talk about PUE in the next couple of slides, uh, power usage uh, efficiency or effectiveness. And there's been a tremendous amount of work done around the world by different organizations in the US Department of Energy, LBNL is Livermore Berkeley National Labs that have worked closely with the US government uh, over the last decade plus, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, and then with vendors, et cetera, whether it's Green Grid or Energy Star or LEED capabilities. For you folks that don't know what PUE is, here's a quick equation. So the effectiveness of power usage over the top is incoming power to your total facility, or it may be your building. And that's always a larger number, and below what gets directly connected to your IT data center equipment. In addition to this PUE, 
if you're into PUE, you understand Grid has developed three different levels of measuring it, which is basically crawl, walk, run, basic, intermediate, or advanced. This is a basic PUE estimate that I'm showing here. It's very quick and inexpensive to do, but it's not completely accurate. And when you see the M's on the left-hand side of your screen and then in the bottom, uh, in the middle of your screen, that just stands for a meter. So M1 might be coming in from your uh, power provider or your utility, coming into your service gear or your building electrical switch gear. And most organizations and most technologies have the capability to get some kind of output out of the back end of their UPS systems. So just a simple picture. DOE, as it's developed, it really started out maybe a decade ago, 12, 14 years ago, where the average PUE was rather high. 2.5 saying it was two and a half times more energy required to run the processors. Now we're starting to see through great efforts and research, et cetera, around the world that that PUE number is coming down. And there's different studies for your regions, whether you're in the European sector or whether you're in uh, the West or the East. And here you see the report in 2016, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs worked very closely over the extended period of time. And we'll talk about that later in this presentation with the Department of Energy. So what this slide is basically saying from these energy saving efforts on a global basis put into practice, we're starting to bear some fruit where uh, as we continue to bring more systems online, we're starting to see some uh, impacts of saving what's already installed. So PUE, implementing best practices, we can reduce our electrical usage and our energy usage, or we can use it in alternative ways. Uh, maybe there's heat that's generated and we can use that heat to do something else. And there's just some examples here of PUE, where it came from, what's going on, and in the future. So this presentation is not completely about PUE, but it's really important as a uh, baseline measurement in data center efficiency. So there's a whole bunch of work going on here. I'll give you a few minutes to glance through the slides. <coughs> and also these slides will be available after this webinar is done. So you can uh, look at it a little deeper. So part of this, when you talk about liquid cooling and immersion cooling, we'll talk near the end of this section of things that you may be seeing. So if you're going to measure it, we'll just call it metering. And this is incredibly complex. If you're in an old data center, 10, 20, 30 years old or older, uh, it can become more challenging depending what you need to install and where you're located. So the key is as you develop an energy usage program, take a look at what you have in place and what you may need to do. And as a starting point, you should monitor these at least once a month. Most organizations do that more frequently, and you'll see some uh, major providers and hosting do this uh, real time uh, on an ongoing basis. In the cases, take a look at uh, a basic decision. Is your facility or the locations that you're looking at a good candidate for efficiency or energy savings to decide if it's worth your time and energy? So just basic metering points at a very high level. Coming into your power and your service entry, there's an electric meter where you pay your bill. Okay. And then there's power to different IQ equipment, whether it's in a UPS, whether you have one or a farm of UPSs at the output, or to your electrical panels or power distribution PDUs or plug strips. Or maybe you're using some kind of data center infrastructure management, these some kind of tools. In the cooling, you know, do you have thermal meters or what kind of calculations? What can you measure right away, whether it's cooling towers or chillers or air conditioners or air handlers? Crack and crap, computer room air conditioners, computer room air handling, depending upon the design of your cooling system. So 
here's just some general airflow best practices. ASHRAE or NEBS have done a bunch of, bunch of work. So they've established some operating ranges and they review these on a regular basis. And tell where you set your points, uh, depending upon your data center design. And then taking a look at different things that you can do. We're going to mention variable frequency drives or VFDs several times uh, because of the key word there, variable. So you can adjust and play with these on demand and save some energy. On your rack input temperatures, if it's a data center and you're racking, your most precise place is to measure just a few inches in front of that server intake, not at the discharge from the crack unit or the return from the crack unit. So you're getting some precise numbers. Whether those are fixed uh, monitoring or sensors or whether you establish some extra that are mobile or wireless that you can move around. Okay, so it gives you some opportunities once you're measuring to be able to adjust your system and managing and get some examples and build some cost savings. I put this back in here basically as I just talk about this is fundamental uh, and I've covered it many times and I'm sure you've seen it. It's a traditional rack in a simple, this assumes it's a raised floor environment and you want cold air coming in at the proper temperature and humidity through your equipment and it should cool itself. A simple design, again, you've probably seen. Rolling around, this is a raised floor environment and the location of the crack units and where the hot aisles and cold aisles may be. For temperature and measuring, this is some specific information on different techniques determining what that uh, measurement approaches are. I didn't want to emphasize so much on that, but if you look at the cartoonish depictions of the graphics at the bottom, on the left-hand side, you see this is set up for three levels of sensors for traditional uh, uh, low to medium-sized servers, pizza box or cake box kind of servers. And those probes or sensors generally uh, there's an old adage at knee level or at belt level or at shoulder level. If you have a more higher density or racks, for example, uh, where do you place your sensors on the right-hand side at the air intake? Just mentioning since we're putting the probes uh, or sensors or medium, where's the proper place to put those? A big target, HVAC and cooling. Chillers and crack units use a lot of energy. So if you can address there, you can get some benefits and some quick wins. Second bullet, these are the temperature and humidity ranges that are generally accepted and recommended uh, through ASHRAE and other organizations. So as you see, 19 to 26 degrees Celsius, every couple of years they add a degree or subtract a degree on this operating environment. Or 68 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 81 degrees, uh, so you can see it's generally shopping mall temperature, which is a great progression over the over the past period of times versus being in a in a chilled uh, room. You can also use outside air. I put free cooling and emphasize because it's not free because you're going to have to run fans and meter and you're going to have to also filter it. But outside air or economizers are great. You can also look at raising the temperature in the room. Okay. Just some high level examples. Of what you can do with your HVAC and unit is you can use economizers in the data center. These are becoming more prevalent in the last several years. We've had economizers for decades in the traditional office environment. Make sure you're using state-of-the-art industry-recognized temperature ranges and manage those temperature settings. Maybe you take a look at your carbon emissions if you're able to measure those. And other things, maybe you look at different coolings. Maybe evaporative cooling can help you out or heat exchangers. But if you're going to use water, 
then you have water issues. It needs to be available and it needs to be treated uh, so it is usable in those environments. So I always like to put a few things on a professional tip. If you've been doing this for a while, you're able to generally walk into a data center without uh, having to review every design drawing and nameplate, but you look around for some general things. Is it a raised floor or not? What is the height of that raised floor if you do have a raised floor and you're using it to cool below? And looking at those airflow tiles we've talked about in previous sessions and their proper placement. <coughs> Excuse me. If you don't have a raised floor, look for how your cooling is delivered. So airflow management and air placements. Also, take a look at racks being properly loaded from the bottom up if your cooling comes from the bottom. And what are your average of your kilowatt loading in racks? Are you in the two to three kilowatt level? Or are you pushing some of the limits? Are you up into the uh, 10, 20, 30 and higher kilowatts per rack range? Of course, blanking panels. Uh, you've probably heard that, put those in place. They're cheap and efficiency, and they yield great benefit. Finally, take a look at the rooms or your data suites. Okay, is the room properly sealed? And I have all six sides of this room because they're generally pressurized, being the four walls, the floor you're standing on, and the ceiling above you. Think of it as six sides. Take a look and see, is there where are your units, your crack units, your air conditioning or air handlers? Are they in the room or the outside of the room? Is there any kind of design for hot aisle or cold aisle? Are you doing some kind of containment of these or those? Another thing to quickly look at, do you have a UPS and is it in the room? If that's the case, then it's adding to the heat load. Heat load, sorry about that. And are you using any computational fluid dynamics, CFD technologies, either in-house or through your engineers, your design people, or your vendors? Quick wins come from secure your raised floor. Make sure there's no, re no leaks. Uh, and check your penetration. If you have a suspended ceiling or some kind of plenum above there, look and see if you have any openings and seal those wherever you can. I threw in these last couple of slides just to give uh, a comparison of some cooling types because I noticed we have a lot of different folks from different regions. It's just a comparison from DX options. So dry cooler versus some other DX. Main advantages is you can get fewer condensing units, use less refrigerants and less piping. On the right hand side, less efficient and all other types of cooling options. So if you're using DX type technology, hmm, it's something to take a look at. Then there's compressor wear, and then you need a coolant or a refrigerant, normally glycol. Quick look, similar expanding on that split systems are not too bad in a small room, uh, inexpensive and modular, simple to put in, but they're not generally very efficient. So this might help you to decide what kind of cooling systems that you have and is that particular location or facility or uh, a room or data center a good candidate or does it take far too much money to retrofit? And then some ideas about evaporative cooling. Uh, it's efficient, it saves some of your equipment and the sizing is smaller, but you got water usage and standard cost and maybe you have to retrofit or it's not a standard option. Things to take a look at. And then a quick comparison on the left-hand side, water-cooled versus air-cooled. Water-cooled is generally much more efficient, but it, again, if you're cooling with water, you gotta be able to treat that water and not only uh, for what goes through the pipes, but on its routing, and that's known as generally a loop uh, for distribution or a redundant loop. And then you have to have make up and redundant water supplies in case you have to replenish that water due to the evaporation. Okay. So if you do have a DX type system, here's some quick hits. Replace the units with different technologies if you're nearing the end of life. 
Maybe you can look at retrofitting some of the components, talking with your engineering and your design and service stands. Maybe you can add variable speed drives, VSDs, and control those supply pan, uh, fans, sorry about that, in parallel. Maybe you can add some types of economizers uh, throughout the systems. Air handling, if you can deal with fan speeds, here's just an example of a variable air volume type technology. If you're mixing cold supply air with hot return air, it can be eliminated. You can maybe play with your fan speeds and reduce that. So energy savings on the fan speeds using different types of uh, VAVs or variable air volume can save you quite a bit of money on, electri on electricity as you see. So we had a few little bits. We start, started on the mechanical. Now I'm going to flip over to our next target area, which is electrical power. This can be a little trickier. Just for the simple matter, if an air conditioner goes offline, it will take a while you know, uh, for the temperature limits to climb outside of your desired settings. And then you get into the acceptable range versus the preferred range, but your equipment will generally continue to run. If you lose electrical power for more than 10, 20 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds mostly, things begin to crash or show down unless you have alternate powers. So IT equipment needs to be energized. So take a look whether that's AC power, street current, whether you're going to direct current, also referred to as battery, and how are you storing energy or alternate sources. So I kind of put in tribal fear of the dark. That's more of keep the lights on, keep the power going. We don't want to mess with anything. So some general tips. If we, there's a lot of power conversions that happen in a critical environment or data center. If you could take a look at those power conversions, and the distribution and length of your conductors or length of your cabling runs on DC current, the voltage drops occur and efficiency. So some studies take a look when you go out and look at some of those sightings that I gave you at the beginning and at the end, is you can lose up to 25 or 30% of wasted before you even get to your connected uh, technology or your compute. More and more organizations are taking a look at getting some batteries closer to the rack itself. And people are taking a look at different batteries, technologies as we get to see more and more of those evolve, and then stored kinetic energy or flywheel technology, which has been around forever. Finally, you can do some things with lighting, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So some of the causes, and again, I recognize and you all will need to recognize also the balance between high availability and efficiency. Sometimes they're on opposite, opposite ends of the spectrum. So taking a look at your system configuration, is it highly available? Like we've talked about uh, active, passive, active, active in the past, whether it's terms such as TIA 942 or the Uptime Institute talking about tier one, tier two, tier three, and four. So what is your design? Second thing is, do you have metering built in here depending on the age of your system? Or sensors or probes where you can pick up in energy programs? And how is your facilities or energy people that are doing this, what are they using for their calculations? Is it nameplate? Are they oversizing, over-engineering, and redundancy, and what kind of controls do you have in place? So then another cause is IT people not talking and communicating with the facilities people and the business people again, uh, and vice versa. We've talked about that in many different uh, previous webinars. And what is your procurement and maintenance processes? So just a simple, uh, simple depiction here a little bit, which talks about what's coming into your building, 480 volts alternating current, and then the different conversions that occur through UPSs and PDUs as you step that down and get it usable down to the actual devices. 
instance, we're talking about, you know, you need to meter and monitor it. There's some just some pictures of different technologies that are out there and different meters in different ways with different ways of using uh, loggers or managing the power quality and availability in your data center. So locations to meter is at your switch gear distributions, at your power sources electrically, whether it's generators or uh, uninterruptible power systems, or PDUs that are uh, facilities-based or uh, floor-mounted, or distribution panels that may be in plug strips all the way down into your server connection environment. There are a lot of options out there for software to manage what you're using in power monitoring and different technologies which are good. Uh, the plug strips now that are installed are really much more advanced than uh, uh, the readings that we were able to take just a short time ago being 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the software is a critical way to manage and report and get an idea on capacity. So it helps you to get information and metrics as you see such as PUE. And it gives you different leads into different energy sources you may want to consider. And this can be integrated with BMS, BMS acronym building monitoring system or building management systems which are more robust or DSIM using that in the data center infrastructure management tools and different IT and energy managers. The idea is being able to track this and monitor and use tools as much as possible. Just some examples I touched on lighting. Part of that is what type of lighting do you want to have and what types of densities? Are you taking a look at maybe uh, what was in place in the past? And are you making conversions to types of the newest and greatest uh, LED type technologies? Again, there's an investment here that, uh, that you may need to carefully consider. Um, and just some examples, what do you want to uh, convert if you have fluorescent type systems, which types of uh, uh, ballasts and controls, or which types of tubes or uh, bulbs do you want to have in place? So LEDs, pros and cons with the lamps and drivers are much more efficient than fluorescent. That's why they've become quite popular in the last five to, 20, five to 10 years, really. And they emit less heat and they have longer life and you can adjust uh, dimmable or turn it off. Okay. Paybacks on a lot of these retrofits are relatively short term. It is a big, uh, generally a significant investment to convince your management to do. But when you look at the payback and time and the energy savings, if you can justify a payback that's 16, 18 months to two years, most times your uh, financial people and your business decisions will listen to those. So lighting control is absolutely in place on new data centers. Old data centers, maybe you had less capability to do that. Again, a different way to calculate and decide if that particular facility or location is a good candidate. I've talked a little bit about VSDs now and mentioned that a few times during the sessions. The key is variable. So it can reduce the energy consumptions on motors and shafts and groundings and fans and pumps to align with demand versus running full out at a single speed. So those VSDs can be used in many different places. Uh, as an energy saving in the electrical side and again crossing back to the mechanical side. So defining application example, CRAC, computer room air conditioners and computer room air handlers, CRAS or CRAS sometimes, and then AHU, air handling units in those fans. Then if you've got water being pumped around, whether it's condensing water or chilled water, you need pumps. 
So the pumps can help you. The VSDs can help you with how to manage those pumps. It's also the same with chillers and with the cooling tower fans. So if you're confused by some of these terms and then their locations, it's time to sit down and have some basic conversation with your engineers or your operators or your facility side of the house and have them explain uh, uh, what it is and maybe uh, spend some time getting yourself educated and doing a little bit of research, take a course, uh, uh, Google it and <laughs> uh, spend some money on that Google search. So other things future thinking that you're going to start to see more and more on is different types of batteries. Traditionally, they've been flooded cells in a special room. Then you know, also quite popular with the uh, VLRAs, which are basically a maintenance-free type battery. Okay. We're starting to see the challenge with some of those. Uh, the VLRAs really have some challenges because uh, there's acid in there. So it needs to be properly contained and managed so you don't injure or harm yourself. But along with that, the, uh, the VLRAs also have a lower battery life. So the design life, they tell you whether it's five to seven years, depending how frequently, how many hits you take, they don't have uh, like a 20 year life like you would expect with the flooded cell or some of the newer technologies. Some of these VLRAs okay, also are slower to recharge and they have less full discharge cycles. So there's been some options that are out there. So you're probably hearing more about lithium ion. Okay. There's some pros and cons. They get much better efficiency and they have great longer lasting life. They have some attributes such as faster charging and you can get more use out of them for a longer time, which means more discharge cycles. But as you may see, they get into flammability. That's why I kind of put this in red. Once you get up to about 104 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you can have some problems where they can uh, create more of a problem. So you'll see if you travel, that's one of the alerts that look if you're on an airplane. Hey, do you have any of these lithium ion type batteries? <coughs> you may need to remove those from, from uh, your checked luggage, etc. Also look more and more for nickel zinc type technologies will start to appear in the future. Again, this is future thinking. The idea about these, they're fast charging and they have good battery life cycle. They're not toxic. And they're comparable price-wise for some high-end lead acid type batteries, but they're cheaper generally in the marketplace than the lithium ions. So something to take a look at next time when you have a capital uh, project where you need to replace a string of batteries, take a look at what your different options are and your system compatibility. Okay, your IT gear that you protect. The good news is uh, the manufacturers working together with standards and some of those organizations that we saw at the opening, there's been absolutely solid progress over the last period of time, especially the last decade, in the design and manufacture of components. So energy star ratings, more efficient uh, components inside of your IT equipment, Pardon me. And we have many years of practice to get more and more efficient technologies. However, take a look again on the flip side of the coin. Is your facility a candidate? Do you have old technology and legacy equipment that uh, is not able to take advantage of what the manufacturers have been supplying? Of course, virtualization of servers, uh, hardware virtualization saves money, uh, cost a lot to implement, but it also allows you to run your servers at a higher capacity. 
and then looking at different storage virtualization versus just the machines. Hold on. <laughs> Pardon me. So take a look at different storage technologies and how they're progressing uh, with the discussion with your storage people. Of course, you can look at the cloud and different technologies that are out there, whether that's an internal or a hybrid or a public cloud, or going to AWS or Azure or a regional options similar to that. But recognizing it's still an energy impact in there. It may not be a direct expense or a line item on your electric bill, but it will be an expense that you incur uh, through that service contract. So talking about then the final category is your people or processes. Pardon me, this is kind of a, uh, take a course. Get your people up to date. If they don't understand anything that's occurring in these previous slides, whether it's as basic as PUE and hot aisle and cold aisle and maintenance, get your people educated. Of course, I default, this is an ICOR WebEx, take some of our courses. The data center energy pre professional and practitioners in 8000 uh, course, has a quick payback for the cost of what it takes and the tools and what you get uh, to be able to apply almost immediately to build a capability or strategy is an immediate payback. Okay. Use tools and resources and capabilities that are tested and proven versus trying to build this up uh, using some Excel spreadsheets or calculations or databases. Talking a little bit about some of those tools. <coughs> this is, I talked earlier about DSIM, or Data Center Infrastructure Management. I thought it'd be good to just put in at least a drawing of what that looks like or what's involved in that capability. So on that, known as a DSIM stack, what are you getting? The benefits operational is capacity planning and you're getting some forecasting and you can play around with some simulations and it helps you to optimize and manage your environment. Uh, it is a wonderful tool to get some efficiencies. So it gets you, again, some integration reporting. And then the boxes along the bottom line there is, is it cooling? controls, your BMS, either building monitoring or management systems, getting alarms, getting your set points and being able to report on those and continuing across the bottom line, what type of assets and how are they configured and how do you manage your change process or change management or change advisory board process. And it helps you go some power and energy measuring and modeling, which makes sense as uh, gaining any kind of efficiency. So it helps you how to also manage some power capping and individual power management all the way down to the IT components with some uh, different vendors. So the idea is you get some data through your research and you get some meters and sensors. And as we open with, if you can measure it, then you can potentially prove it and improve it. And just a couple of screenshots here, basically. It's from, there's a variety of different vendors out there. And how is your PUE number coming? And what is the capability? And what are you setting it for? So other than DSIM to consider, future thinking, things that are being developed and put into place, you'll see more and more, we talked a little bit at the beginning of some research that was being done in the UK and Scandinavia, immersion cooling. And we'll talk a little bit about the couple of flavors of that for immersion cooling can help you not only for energy efficiency, but it can help you if you have issues where you're running out of space or running out of capacity, or if you have specialty needs. You're consuming less energy in immersion cooling because you're using water as a medium rather than the air. 
So in some places, regional adoption, or as you see it, is much more likely where space is at a premium uh, or temperature or uh, regional conditions are a consideration. So regional adoptions, maybe that might be more in the Asia markets or uh, portions of Europe. Or, uh, for example, in the United States where real estate uh, and space is at a premium, whether that's on either coast, whether you're in the New York cities or uh, in Los Angeles or in San Francisco, for an example. So a thing to look at some of this is consider cost, but not only maintenance involvements, and then the cost of uh, uh, any kind of infrastructure retrofits that you need to do. And with the immersion cooling, um, I don't recommend, even if it's a dialectic or non-fluid conducted oil, or I probably don't want to drop your server in there. So take a look at your hard drive compatibility Take a look at some of the weight factors and safety and vendor capabilities and compatibility. There's much more information and in deployment uh, where these systems are being used now, not only uh, in the USA, but also in Europe and portions of Asia. You can also look at direct liquid coolings, whether that's uh, using some kind of cold plate technology in bringing the coolant directly into the devices. So the benefit of this is you're bringing the cooling right to the source of the heat, which reduces your fan usage and fan power. And you can then uh, use that medium for uh, uh, of cooling water or uh, a liquid refrigeration. Challenges? It's a unique server. You're going to spend more money, and it's going to be customized. So take a look and see what's available out there and what the cost benefit is. You have liquid closer to your devices, and what is the liquid? You know, is it a dielectic? Is it a, a refrigerant? Or is it just chilled water? And when you're saying not room neutral, you might have to have the infrastructure or chillers to support this. A little bit on immersion cooling. There's a single phase, as you see, it's really using something similar to a mineral oil or a dialectic or non-conductive. So positives is you use less fans because you're getting cooling through this warm liquid medium. And they can be installed in many locations. It's not completely neutral for room, but it's near neutral. Uh, so it may be worth investigating to see if this is something that fits into your overall energy plans. I don't completely agree with the additional floor space concept. Depends how your room is configured. You might have to be adding additional equipment, but maybe you can use uh, immersion cooling when you're out of floor space or real estate space. Okay, And it has Getting your full potential is getting the right equipment that you can uh, put your servers into this immersion type environment. So here's a couple of examples of some, some of the leaders out there, uh, uh, leading adopters of vendors, whether it's, uh, so if you look out and look GR, GRC, I think they're just using the acronym now, GRC versus Green Revolution in their marketing over the last uh, period of time basically a mineral oil type approach. And then a couple of other vendors, they have engineered fluids. Then you have two-phase immersion cooling, which is where you're picking up an additional coil to be able to reuse it. So they have uh, really, uh, for higher end, harder working servers, <coughs> their higher density capability so in the past, when we talked about immersion cooling, the main targets and thoughts were that were either uh, the big government supercomputers or academic research where a lot of horsepower versus traditional business environments. So we're starting to see the creep and the crossover uh, from those type of target institutions to more commercial applications. 
And again, you're cooling, you're saving on fans, and it's near room neutral versus uh, it can be installed in some applications with some investigation talking with the vendors. So again, it may need some additional space and density. It's a little bit more of a complex technology. So as you educate yourself, is it single phase or two phase immersion cooling? But you will be seeing it in the future. And here are some manufacturers that are uh, out there that are, uh, are known on some of this uh, service offering that's available. And of course, a couple of insert pictures as you begin to look at this immersion cooling. Hmm. Other things to consider. Since we're getting near the end of the year, kind of that future thinking, that generally there's a tradition in the last quarter of the year to say, what are the top 5, 10, 15 things that we will see next year are coming? AI, artificial intelligence. Currently in use, one of the major cloud providers is using this, and they call their tool DeepMind. And you can uh, do a little bit of research. I didn't uh, have approval to put in the siting there. But if you take a look uh, uh, and you know, spend a couple of energy dollars doing your Google search, as we talked about, it will become pretty clear which vendor is doing that. I don't imagine in the near future they're going to make that open source and available to everyone, because it is one of their competitive advantages. So you have artificial intelligence, or AI, being more and more talked about. And then also, you're hearing more and more about deep learning systems. Deep learning alternatives can increase efficiency in the future. And again, chilled water systems for bigger IT design facilities. The break point is somewhere around greater than 400 kilowatts, uh, half a megawatt, four to 500 kilowatts. Use water cool versus air cool, and maybe you can retrofit some of that into your DX systems and chillers. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, you can always kick up your room environment, your operating conditions, instead of trying to have that at the low end of shopping mall temperatures, being 19 or 20 degrees Celsius, 68 to 70. You can save some money by kicking that up closer to 20, 25, 26 degrees Celsius, up to 27. The same with your, in Fahrenheit, getting up 78, 79, 80 degrees. <coughs> and that's, uh, but the key there, as I mentioned with some of the sensors, those intakes should be right to the specific IT equipment, specifically your critical IT equipment. So those measuring points are just a couple inches in front of the server intake. Take a look at using either air side or water side economizers into your design, depending where you're at regionally, what the outside environment is. So maybe it's a discussion with your operators and your design engineers. Liquid cooling, of course, helps you to manage really dense IT loads whether that's just straight liquid or chilled water, or we're talking about the immersion cooling or refrigerants. Take a look at variable speed drives and fan drives on everything for your fans, pumps, chillers, and towers, and of course, heat exchangers wherever possible. I wanted to end here with just a little bit of look into the energy. have this play here for you a second. Give me one second to work through this. Okay, we'll do this a different way. Second here, sorry for this inconvenience. As noted, 
all the time. Technology can be fun and improving. I'm going to go to the end of this. Okay. So, at the end of this slide, we talk about a few different sources that we've talked to and went through quickly, whether it's government energy or stuff uh, research through uh, university and academia and different publications that are available. And of course, uh, uh, you know, ICOR has been working uh, again with DCEP and Livermore uh, with Berkeley University. And this is a wonderful way to learn and pick up that expertise very quickly. Now let's go back to my video. Let's see if we can get this baby to play. Here we go. I tell you what, sometimes technology fights you and uh, uh, we're having some stormy weather. So that video I was planning to put up, we'll try and make that available to you for other sources. It's a couple of minutes to take a look at. Yeah, so Jim, it's the very first reference here. So if you just look, if you search under YouTube for Energy 101, Energy Efficient Data Centers, you can find it there. It's about a two and a half minute video. And What's nice about it is it shares all of those future things that we were talking about and shows you pictures of how it's being done. Excellent. Thank you for the intervention and support on that, Linda. <laughs> I just wanted to um, give a couple of data points um, that, that Jim had um, mentioned briefly is that this presentation will be available on the webinar page of the website starting tomorrow. It will be available for 30 days. Um, for anybody, if you want to view it again, or if, or if you had to, um, if you got on late or something, and um, after 30 days, it's in our our resource center just for members. We are working on our schedule. If you have any thoughts and suggestions for what you'd like us to um, talk about in 2020, we have a we're putting together our outline for our schedule, and it should be coming out in the next week or so. But we would also um, invite you to contribute and give us some ideas on what you're looking forward to hear and learn more about. Thank you for attending today. And if you have attended for 30 minutes or more, you will be getting a certificate of attendance that you can use for points for any certification that you need to maintain. Thanks again for attending our um, 2019 webinar series. And we hope to see you again in 2020.